if you like betting on golf but everyone that your back misses the cut get some experts involved with all the stats and the tips and so much more cause it's the golf betting system the golf betting system is the golf betting system podcast greetings and welcome to the golf betting system podcast 145 this is our 2021 century tournament of champions episode paul williams joins me steve bamford to discuss the 2021 pga tour kickoff in hawaii good morning pw how are you Good morning, Steve, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to listeners. How did you enjoy the festivities? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was different. Um, <laughs> Mooted? It's about the only, way, about the only way you can describe life at the moment, isn't it? But yeah, no, it was nice to spend some time with the um, immediate family. Um, a real shame not to see the extended family, but hey, that's the, uh, the world that we live in right now, isn't it? And... Uh, Live in hope that things will be better by this time next year. I had one bet over the Christmas period and it right. lost. And then from that point on, I never backed a horse again for the whole. And I watched a lot of horse racing over Christmas, and I didn't. I was strong. I, I bet I backed Epitont at some ridiculous odds on price at Kempton, mm. and it lost. <laughs> So that's that, the was end my, of that. that was my betting over the Christmas and New Year period. Yeah, it's nice to have a little break from it. I don't, I don't have a little dabble yeah. with the football um, True. now and again. But other than that, no, it's. Um, I did have a little look at Altior when he was um, <sighs> he she when when the, when when he was racing. Um, but uh, yeah, decided to leave that alone, which was a good move in the end. All of the short odds on horses, apart from Altior and Epitant, won. I think. Yeah. And I was hovering on the Altior one the day after. And I, for God's sake, Steve, put your phone away. Yeah. So I, I didn't back that one. Mm. Anyway, completely uh, off piste. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more information. And of course, please bet responsibly, like I did over Christmas. Visit our world famous golf betting system website with our in depth betting previews. Masses of tournament statistics and our predictor models, all available completely free of charge with no paywall. That's all fully up to speed for this century tournament of champions. I'll run through uh, my predictor model later on in the pod, my top 10. Please subscribe to this podcast and drive the popularity of the show. Paul is available on Twitter at Golf Betting. I'm available at Bamford golf you can join our golf betting system facebook group the link avail is available in the description box that's up to 5700 members as we sit here now plus look out for the steve bamford golf youtube channel where i present the golf betting show every week we also place this podcast now on youtube and i don't know about you I, I'm, I'm quite an avid podcast listener um i tend to um, listen to quite a few podcasts now on YouTube. Yeah, I don't know why. Just I, they just I don't know. It just seems less hassle to me. They they end up on my profile and I ju- and I just play them. If you do listen to this podcast on YouTube, by the way, listeners, it would be fantastic if you could like the show. Um, please take time to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. That is the podcast currency and drives our listener numbers continually upwards. As ever. For those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of next week's show. Now, we went through quite a few at the end of 2020. I have no reviews. So, listeners, please give us a five-star review and I will be reading it out. Uh, Leave your name in the review. I'll read out your review for the Sony Open show, which is next week. Right, that's the introduction done. 2021 Century Tournament of Champions. I quite, I've, I always quite like this event. Yeah, yeah. I tell you, it's, it's great to kick the year off with um, what's always a nice high-profile event. It's the time difference which always gets me because you get all excited about the uh, the event starting and then the, the TV coverage doesn't start till like and, ten o'clock um, UK time in the and evening. And you can't, yeah, you can't watch any live golf effectively unless you're some kind of nutcase over yeah. here who clearly hasn't got children. Um, yeah. But yes, um, 
as ever with COVID, I mean, we're, Paul and I are in the UK. Um, we've just received a, um, you know, you're in trouble when um, the Boris Johnson announcement is is going to be on TV at eight o'clock. You know, you know, you're in trouble. And he closed down all the schools yesterday or, or from today. So we're in this COVID world again where apparently you can't leave the house unless you're going to get some food or a bit of exercise. So that's where we're at in the UK. Well, sorry, in England. I think it's the same in Scotland and Wales. I know that over in a, in, a, in the United States, if you're listening over there, it differs from state to state. So we're still in this COVID world. And the COVID world is actually, um, this is a segue, by the way, it's actually changed the makeup of this field. Because clearly, Century Tournament of Champions has always been, until this point, a purely um, winner's event. So the winners of the calendar year building up to uh, for the, this first January um, uh, uh, tournament. Now, though, because there were less tournaments last year, we have a situation where there were 17 qualifiers for this via the 2022 Championship. So effectively, if you made the top 30 in the FedEx Cup Series playoffs last year. Yeah, it is last year, yeah, last yeah. season. Yeah. Um, you also qualify for this now. So there's quite a few non-winners in it. Just to, to be clear, 45 players could have played this, but three haven't. One being Jim Herman, who's injured. And yeah, two being vision. European... And two being Rory McIlroy and Tyrrell Hatton, who yeah. you would assume... Are going to be playing Abu Dhabi in a fortnight. They, I think Rory's already said these. Yeah, Rory's in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Hatton's playing uh, the Dubai Desert Classic, and the week okay. after, yeah. But a trip, a trip to the mid Pacific probably isn't going to do their body clock the world of good, is it? I suppose that's the way they're looking at yeah. it. So, by my reckoning, we've got a field of forty-two, and fifteen of those are non-winners from last year. In fact. Two of them have never won on the PGA Tour, one being Abraham Anser and one being Scotty Scheffler. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a mix, it's a hybrid kind of field. This, But you've got to say, I mean, the quality is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I, I think, think it's the, the best ever, isn't it, in terms of the, yes. um, the rating? That's why I've heard it's, got the, it's the highest rated in terms of official world golf ranking points ever. Mm. And you're seeing DJ at sixes heading the market. Uh, JT at sevens. We're recording this early um, Tuesday morning in uh, the UK. John Rahm at fifteen to two. There was a tickle of eight to one about him when the prices first came out on Monday. Xander's at tens, and Bryson DeChambeau at eleven to one. Which we were talking off mic. I thought that was quite a good price considering he was the runaway favourite for the Masters last time he played. Yeah, it's, it's, there's still a bit of reaction to Bryson's price, isn't there? Depending how he appears to be playing, um, and we saw that again p- before he won the uh, the, the US Open, where it uh, twenty five kind of, to one. Yeah, it'd gone off the boil a bit, and he did the couple of starts before out to twenty five to one, and then then suddenly bang, and you're looking at the price and thinking, bloody, hell, that was a that was a good price in in hindsight. But yeah, yeah, was he what, fifth favorite this week? So fifth, uh, yeah. Yeah, clearly. Behind clearly. Xander, which is crazy, but then Xander's got such a great course record, mm. hasn't he? Yeah. First and second in the last two um, times he's visited here at the plantation course. We then we then drift slightly to Patrick Reed at sixteen, who is a real horse for a course. Uh, Cantley and Matsuama at eighteens. Webb at twenties. Finau. <laughs> You're talking about a win only, winners only event. You got Tony Fino, and it does make me titter. Twenty two to one for Tony. T four Tony, Victor Hovland at twenty two to one, and then we're out to twenty eight with Morikawa Berger at thirties. English, who hasn't won since twenty thirteen, he's in this winners only event at thirty three to one, and then out to Scotty Scheffler. And Cam Smith with the Yo King Neiman and Sung Jm all at forty to one, but yeah, quality field. I mean, you mm. still got the likes of Champ, Scott, Kisner. Kisner at sixty sixes, I thought was a good price, especially in his second last time he played. 
Yeah, there's there's a lot you can make a case for, isn't there? Further down. Um, mm. Decent quality field. It's, it is a good field. It's a very good field. Um, let's talk about the course, shall we? Um, to say it's unique um, is kind of an understatement. It's a 7,596 yard par 73. And I don't think they play, well, not they certainly don't on the PGA Tour. They don't play another par 73. No, the, there used to be one, The which one, I think it was the Trophy, tro, trophy Hassan De used to be played on, on 73. Yeah. Um, but this, yes, this is a bit different, isn't it? With five, no, yeah, yeah. There's only three par th- par threes, isn't there? I think three right. par threes and eleven par fours, mm. and just the you know, just you'd have thought you'd assume with a seventy three, it'd have five par fives, but it's got four par yeah. fives, eleven par fours, and only three par threes. So, I, uh, one of the things that I looked at in the predictor model is someone that so far this season has been doing very well on par four scoring. Mm-hmm. Makes logical sense. Uh, and when you look at the split of winners here, um, a lot of them have equaled um, in the in, in previous years. If you look at the way that they accumulated their score. Um, I'm looking here a couple of what were you, when was this Dustin Johnson in 2018 he actually shot 12 under on the par fours and 12 under on the par fives so yeah. um you know you can get to double figure digits here I mean going back to Jordan Spieth when he won at that crazy 30 under total or something oh Justin Thomas rather four under on the threes 13 under on the fours and he was only five under on the fives when he won here for the first time so if you can um, there's something crazy here, like I think it's eight, eight f- sub four hundred and twenty-five yard par fours. Yeah, and this is the point, isn't it? If you get your drive away on these, and they're, they're big old fairways as well, aren't they? If you get your drive away here, then um, you're just having a, a, a short iron or a wedge into a lot of these greens. And uh, if you get your proximity right, you're going to be scoring a lot of uh, scoring well. You're going to be making a lot of birdies. Now, the course itself, it's a Court and Crenshaw 1991 original. It featured a 2019 renovation, which came into play for the first time last year at the 2020 Tournament of Champions. And when you read through the detail, um, Bill Course said uh, that he wanted the course to play firmer and faster ongoing. Because when you had Spieth taking it apart 30 under, you actually go back to early, you know, um, go back to when this was held here the first few years. Scores were quite tough. Mm. You know, 11, 12, 13 under was winning. And then over the years, as the course deteriorated, the wind, the amount of wind that the course receives uh, subsided. Scoring got to that crazy 30 under total with Spieth. So they renovated it. Um, they made the they they re- renovated all the greens. They re um, they regrassed them with Bermuda Tiff Eagle. Yeah. I think before they may have been champion. I might be talking out of turn. Then don't take that on. What well, I'm just I'm just talking rubbish. I think I think they were always Tiff Eagle, but they they've refreshed them with Tiff Eagle. Um, they recontoured them. They made the greens apparently um, less contoured. Uh, they've made them bigger. They are massive. I mean, you're talking about wide fairways, which they are. They're over 60 yards wide on average. Mm. Uh, a normal PGA Tour course, you're looking at 28 to 30. US Open, you were looking at 20 to 18 to 22 yards. For, uh, uh, yeah. And now we're talking 60. So, again, uh, you know, if you're just looking at a picture here of a, of a player, I mean, the fact that Patrick Reed excels around here, you know, is one of the most inaccurate drivers you'll ever find. I mean... I remember him at the DP World Tour Championship that middle, um, was it the second week of December? Mm. And his driving was absolutely shocking. Every time I watched him drive the ball, it was in the rough or it was just nowhere near. Hey, his short game, though. And his short game. I think he, he made, it was like eight strokes gained total with his, uh, with his chipping and yeah. around the green game. It was just like Houdini that week. He was absolutely incredible around the greens. 
And yeah, it could have been what he does well here, because actually, yeah. even someone as inaccurate as Reed will be hitting sixty-five to seventy percent of fairways, and he can bang the ball at long distance. And when you've got hands like he's got in terms of eighty, ninety, hundred yards and in, you can make scores, yeah. especially on these par fours that are short. To me. I remember when Zach Johnson won here, I always had this completely, completely 100% focused on bombers. Oh, bombers win here. has to be a bomber. But actually, you go through the winner's list in the past. Um, Jeff Ogilvie was, wasn't exactly a bomber, was he? And he won here twice on the yeah. trot. Jonathan Bird. You had Stevie Stricker. Uh, Jordan Spieth. We've had Reed win here. And we've had Zach Johnson. You haven't got to be a bomber. Um, Some fantastic just, putters in there as well, isn't there? Ah, uh, yeah. I, for me, it's about great wedge game. Someone also that can take advantage with long, especially on the par fives. If you've got a fantastic long iron game, I think that's a real advantage around here. Mm. Um, and also, this course doesn't exactly play to the yards as well because it's a coastal course. There's a, there's a hell of a lot of undulation and blind shots here, blind tee shots. Shots that professionals don't face week in, week out. A lot of undulation both up and down. They say it's the hardest walk for caddies of the whole year. Um, you know, it's kind of comparable, if not worse, than Augusta National in terms of yeah. the elevation changes. Yeah. So you get blind shots, blind drives. Um, and you also can get some serious wind here. And of course, you know, I love it this time of year when you start talking about the trade wins or the Kona wins. Um, it's trade wins again. This golf course is set for trade wins, which yeah. are from the northeast and the east. It tends to make the course play shorter. And from what I'm seeing, the trade wins this year aren't anywhere near as strong as last year. So when you look at that winning score last year, it it it, it collapsed from Xander 23 under in 2019 with JT. Patrick Reed and Xander all making a playoff at 14 under last year. And when you read player interviews and you can remember the recaps from the rounds, a lot of the trouble clearly was that it was blowing 30 to 40 miles an hour for a couple of, uh, for three days. And also, JT said in one of his interviews, when they were putting pins at the front of greens, because these greens were brand new and totally and utterly unreceptive, you just couldn't get the ball anywhere near. No, no, no. You're going way past it. You were going way past it, or you were trying to just uh, almost, you know, a bit of standard um, linksy type golf where you're trying to get the ball just to chase up. Yeah, interesting to see how they've changed. You know, cause a year further down the line, they should have yeah. bedded in a bit. They sh should be a bit more in. receptive, shouldn't they? Often you get with these brand new greens, they are really bumpy and firm, aren't they? So, yeah, 12 months down the line, perhaps a little bit of respite. Now, I'm looking at the wind forecast for Thursday, right now on the, uh, on the laptop in front of me, and they're looking as if we are... Um, we're going to be seeing 15 to 20 on Thursday. We're going to be seeing 15 to 20 on Sunday, which for round here isn't that strong. And Friday and Saturday, it's literally Tranquility City. Mm. So I think this is going to be far lower scoring this year. Yeah, As you said, you would assume that the Greens have bedded in 12 months. They've had plenty of foot traffic now. They'll be softer. Um, and when you're seeing that kind of wind forecast for the Friday and Saturday, I think they can be taking this golf course apart. Twenty, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that Xander kind of totals in play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty three, yeah. twenty four under. It, feel, it feels like a particularly for you know par seventy three. It feels like it's uh, it's going to be in excess of twenty under, doesn't it? Given mm. that forecast. 8,700 square feet greens with that Tiff Eagle Bermuda grass. And you mentioned a while ago, you know, JT can be a phenomenal putter. He's won here twice. Dustin Johnson's won here twice. When he's on his game, again, another fantastic putter. Zach Johnson, one of the best of all time with the flat stick. Jordan Spieth, well... <laughs> You don't need to. Uh, when Jordan was in his pomp, you know, yeah. he, he 30, 30 foot putts were going in with crazy regularity. Mm. And even Xander, Xander can be a, a, a mighty good putter. You don't, 
and Patrick Reed, you don't tend to see complete and utter um, Jason Coke rags like winning this in terms of their putting ability. Mm. Or dare I say, who should I who should I put in there in terms of bad putters? Um, <laughs> I'm just trying. I mean, to me, someone like a uh, Colin Morikawa, where putting's the weak point yeah. of his game. I would have said Adam Scott once upon a time, but I look at Adam Scott's putting stats recently and he's been putting incredibly well from what I can see. He actually headed up headed up my eight-week putting average stat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, he, he popped in a few of the numbers I looked at. And, uh, yeah, again, that was another one of them. He's, uh, he's clearly uh, clearly doing something right with his putting. Um, got a new putter as well, I saw on Twitter yesterday, that he's taking on into the tournament this week. So interesting to see how he goes on that. He's got a new putter, and the other thing that I noticed of significant, for me, um, importance was the fact that John Rahm switched from TaylorMade to Callaway. Mm. And at this time of year, I'm, I'm, I hate golfers that have changed equipment manufacturer. Yeah, it's a difficult one to assess, isn't it? Yeah. If you, I mean, and this is what I've, I said in my betting preview, which is clearly detailed and available at Golf Betting System for all listeners. Um, if you're trying to split hairs with that top five, arguably the top five in the in the world at the moment, um, you've got to take something like that and say, well, actually, that's the reason I wouldn't back Rahm. Because mm. statistically, you won't get rid of him because his no. statistics are always fantastic. But yes, clearly he will have been practising with those Callaway clubs for a length of time. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a good enough reason for me not to like him in that, at that kind of 15 to 2 price point. Mm. So we reckon the weather's going to be more favourable for the players. Um, 24 degrees pretty much throughout, so a nice comfortable um, 24 degrees Celsius. I'm just looking at uh, key, key trends uh, from, from a skill set perspective. So what I do, I've taken 2010 through 2020, the winners here, and I look at their traditional stats and their, uh, for that period of time and just see where the, each winner ranked in the various different um, skill sets of the game. So averaging it out, Ogilvy through to JT last year, driving distance 12th. Bearing in mind, this field is usually, what, 30 players? Yeah. So 12th would be upper third, but not, you know, not, you know, it's not pure bombers. Driving accuracy 17th, greens in reg 9th, proximity to hole 10th, scrambling 8th, which is quite high, and putting average 3rd. So it never, you know, it never to be, especially with these tournaments where it tends to be a scenario where you've got to shoot 23, 24 under. It's all about converting those chances, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think one of the really interesting stats for here, though, is though that year in, year out, this course, the plantation course at Kapalua, tra- traditionally ranks inside the top 10 most difficult courses in terms of proximity to hole every year. Yeah, do you think that's a factor of the size of the greens? Size of the greens, I think the contour, the, the, they were quite severely contoured yeah, greens were, as well. Yeah, yeah. I think also you, you, you're coming in on quite a few holes with um, uneven lies, mm. and that doesn't help, does it? Most of these fairways are canted, and you, you get a lot of balls above or below the feet, and that, that you know, it all adds to the difficulty in terms of that proximity number especially in a windy yeah. kind of renewal. And even when it's blowing 15 to 20, that's quite a significant wind to be to actually be managing. Yeah, it's a, a, a kind of the topography of the course does negate it a little bit because you, you can, as, as you've seen in recent years, you can still play here when it's blowing 30, 40 miles an hour and um, it just makes it tougher rather than impossible. But um, yeah, it, it, it keeps them honest, I think, without causing them too many problems. Winning scores, 2020 was JT at 14 under, Xander was 23 under in 19, DJ was 24 under in 2018. Justin Thomas was 22 under in 2017. I scored with Thomas both years that he won here, 2017 and 2020. Um, I'm about to sneeze, but um, it's right, yeah, anyway, I can fight that off, I think. (laughs) Jordan Spieth won at 30 under and Patrick Reed at 21 under. 
So since 2015, um, those are the winning scores. And the other thing I find interesting, and I always look at for each golf tournament, are the tra- the winning prices of champions that we've had. So bearing in mind it's a short field and it traditionally featured only winners, so very you know an excellent field each year. The average from 2010 through to 2020 is 16 to 1. Mm. The past seven renewals since they went to this split system where the season starts in the fall, that comes down to 14 to 1. And since 2016, we've had Jordan Spieth at 5 to 1, Dustin Johnson at 15 to 2, and Justin Thomas at 11 to 2. So three of the last five winners of this have been single digit odds. The other two were Xander at 22 to 1 and Justin Thomas at 22 to 1. Yeah, no massive, massive shocks, are they? Um, the biggest which, price we've indicated ever indicated seen here, Paul. Yeah, well, and the nature of the field, I suppose. But the b- biggest price we've seen win here was Jonathan Bird in 2011, who used to be one of these resort course monsters, didn't he, Jonathan Bird? Give him 25 under golf course, and all of a sudden he'd appear from nowhere. He won here at 50 yeah, yeah. to 1 in 2011. If I remember correctly, he came fresh from winning the Shriners Open where he won with a hole-in-one in the playoff. Yeah, in the dark, yeah. yeah. Beating Martin Laird in the dark. And he then didn't play until he came here and then he won the the uh, Tournament of Champions as well. Yeah, right on top of his game back then, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a decent player, top 50 in the world. If we're looking at this golf course from a strokes game perspective, and I've gone back to 2016 Jordan Spieth, so Spieth, Thomas, Dustin Johnson, Xander and JT last year. Again, doing the same exercise, averaging out their skill sets. Strokes gained off the tee, fourth. Strokes gained on approach, fifth. Strokes gained around the green, sixth. Strokes gained tee to green, second. Strokes gained putting, fifth. Doesn't really tell you a lot. Um, I would suggest, though, that you would need to be in the top two in the strokes gain T to green category to win this week. Uh, JT was second last year. Sander was third. And then before that, DJ, Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth were all first strokes gain T to green. Yeah, and I suppose that's a lot of this to do with proximity, isn't it? And, uh, you know, as you said, it's one of the tougher tracks to actually get close to to the pin. But if you are one of those players who is getting close making your putts on these Bermuda greens, then uh, you're going to give yourself a great chance, I think. Yes. He was stroke 13th for strokes going putting last year, JT. Yeah. Um, for me, it's not so much distance of putts made. It's going to be, again, creating enough of these shorter chances to then make the conversion. Yeah. Um, I think three putting around here on greens at an 8,700 feet. Again, you've... It does kind of lead you to decent putters, even if it's a situation where natural born putters that can make a 60 feet lag putt up a quite a severe contour against the grain on Tiff Eagle. There's a lot of different parts that go into the equation of putting around here. There's grain, there's uphill, there's downhill. There's the fact that, you know, do you take into account the break towards the sea or don't you? Is it a straight putt? There's a lot of complexity on these greens. And, of course, you can get 15 to 20 mile an hour winds blowing at you across those greens this week as well. And at least two of the days. So I I don't think, for me, it's a pure 100% ball strikers course with someone that can't putt. I I think you've got to have some kind of natural ability with the flat stick eventually. I think I've witted on more than enough, actually. Um, who would you take from the top five? Not um, that you're a win only. Not that you're no, a win only. Backer, you know, I, I know. I, I haven't backed one in the top five. Um, I may. I may do. You've almost convinced me on one, but I'll leave them to you. Um, my knee-jerk reaction was Xander. Um, you know, you look through his last. His last one of the tour was here, wasn't it? Back in twenty nineteen, and yeah. it's come very close since. Although I guess you could. You know, you've virtually class that tour championship effort where he was the best score of the week 
um, as a mm. win, although it didn't it obviously doesn't count um, as a traditional win in that sense. But but he's been putting really well. I mean, you, you look at his stats; he's been putting really well. He's been hitting greens, scrambling well. Got a fantastic record here. Um, I was all ready to pull the trigger, and then you find that he's um, just recovering from COVID. Um, he's been That's interesting. That, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's good, he, good he's, insight, Paul. Like he's it. yeah, he, and I, I hadn't noticed until a day or two, um, oh, you know, okay. before. I, 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 well, you know, over the back end of the weekend uh, um, uh, yesterday. Yeah, I didn't spot that one. Um, and you know, he's, there's been reports that he's. Um, He's still a bit fatigued, which you'd expect. You know, COVID hits people in different ways, doesn't it? Some people just brush it straight off. Some people will get a, a you know, a, a more severe or you know, a, a, a fluy type symptoms, which can take um, take time to overcome. So that's kind of put me off because it is a, a bit of a slog, isn't it? It's a bit of a trek this tra- course, and if you're not feeling absolutely a hundred percent in terms of your um, well-being and your your um, you know your general fitness, then um, it, it might not be the best of um, best of ways to start your year. I mean, he may come out, he may come out, and he may be uh, absolutely fine on all cylinders, and ten to one might prove to be a decent score. But um, yeah, I, I kind of spotted that before I pulled the trigger, which was either fortunate or unfortunate because it's put me off, regardless, one way or the other. But uh, but yeah, he was he was my knee jerk. Um, if I was going to take one, it would be the guy that you've backed out of the top five. So I won't steal your thunder on that respect. I was quite pleased with the price I got on him, to be honest, because he won here last year at 11 to 2. Um, and I was expecting a similar kind of price. Uh, the first the first um, show on the board was Bet three six five. They were eleven to two. I think William Hill came in at eleven to two. Or was it no? Sorry, thirteen to two, wasn't it? Mm. They came yeah. in at, and then all of a sudden Unibet popped up at fifteen to two. And I, I'd made my mind up. I'd made my mind up over Christmas. I was going to put him up. In fact, I, I made my mind up on all three before Christmas. Um, Clearly, if there'd been something like a um, equipment change announced, or like you said, a COVID or something like that, I'd have changed. But yeah, I, I thought fifteen to two on Justin Thomas was a decent price. And if you wanted the perfect golf course for someone like JT, I think this is it, isn't it? First twenty seventeen, third twenty nineteen, first twenty twenty. I'm not one for backing defending champions. But he's already defended a title in the past. He actually won the 2015 and 2016 CIMB Classic over in Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. Um, those were the first ever PGA Tour titles he won, and he defended successfully. And that reminds me of sort of when Daniel Berger did that at Southwind. I think that was 16, 17. Um, but yeah, there's not many that do that. So he can defend. And, um, you know, he just seems to love this golf course. He, he's the kind of guy, it all boils down to the flat stick with Justin. If he's got this putting game with him, um, he's difficult to beat. Yeah. And actually, his putting of late has been good. It's been very, very good. Um, he ranks second in my rolling eight-week window on strokes gained putting. And he also ranks in the top five for putts per GIR, putting average. So if you look at the traditional stats. Now, the strokes game putting won't include Mayakova, where he played in December. But the putting average putts per GIR does include that number. And he putted well over in Mexico. And that's the other thing that I've noticed with this. A bit of insight that I always like to look at. 11 of the last 12 winners here all played competitive golf in the previous December. Now, when the world was normal, that could have been in Australia, (laughs) with the Australian Open, Australian PGA, and the events they play down there. Or it would have been at Tiger's Hit and Giggle, the Hero World Challenge. And or that QBE shootout that Greg Norman hosts down in Florida, Mm. the team event. And if you look at Justin Thomas... And you look at him compared to the rest of the players at that top end. Dustin Johnson, we haven't seen since that emotional, tear-jerking win at Augusta National. John Rahm, we haven't seen him since Augusta National. Xander, we haven't seen him since Augusta. And he's suffered with COVID. And Bryson DeChambeau, he played. He didn't play for five or six weeks before the Masters, did he? Played the Masters poorly and hasn't played since. 
So, you know, if we're looking at this 11 out of 12 trend continuing, out of the top five, only JT actually passes that test. Yeah, he, yeah. he passes it quite well. 12th at Mayakoba, and then two weeks later, he played in the father and son PNC Championship. The fact that it's a nothing event is buggle to do it is the fact that he played some competitive golf in front of TV cameras, played with his dad, and they won the PNC Championship, beating Vijay Singh and his son by a shot and beating Tiger Woods and Charlie Woods. Yeah. So he's had that, and that was played, guess where, in Florida on Bermuda grass greens. Yeah. And if you, if you go down to the you know the most simplistic and, and take that factor and combine it with the recent winning scores that we've seen around here, the only person it does point you in the direction of is Justin Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I, I, as I say, I think you've, you've, you've virtually convinced me that a, uh, a, a kind of a win-only bet on JT could be the way to go. And I, I tend to take notes, um, particularly in this event, of who you pack, who you back, because you've got a particularly strong um, record here. I know that you don't take any notice for the other 50 odd <laughs> events of the year, but this one you actually think, I oh, know, I'm onto something. So. Yeah, that's it, yeah. See, see who Steve puts up and, uh, and follow suit. But no, no, I think, I, I, I think of, of the top, top guys, I think JT is the, uh, the, the pick to go for. I do agree. If I then go down below that, Reed is clearly. Reed here is absolutely fantastic, isn't he? If you actually go look at the average score, and I know that we have our the, the statistics that you pull together every week, Paul, for the for all of the tournaments, be that PGA Tour, European Tour, majors, and whatever. If you actually look at the event average score by the competitors, Hideki Matsuama has the best average score for this event. He's played he's played here three times: 2015, 2017, 2018. He's finished third, second, and fourth. And Matsuama is in no way, shape or form a natural born putter. He hasn't won here though, but it does show you that T to green excellence and a, a guy that can hit the ball very well and has a great all round game. Because we know with Matsuama, you know, the approach the, and the scrambling is always top notch. He's an elite level player. That can get you close to winning this event. I and mean, we've had the likes of Gary Woodland. Again, Woodland isn't, you know, you look at Woodland, he's a tee to green guy, isn't he? He's not a natural putter um, over the course of his career. I know that his putting's better now than the tee to green side, but if you look at over, look at him over five years, Woodland is tee to green and not a putter. Mm. So you can get close here, but you, you, I think ultimately you've got to be a good putter. Uh, Streb next, 69. Um, he's only played here once, he finished eighth. Then you get Laird, DJ, he's played here 10 times, course average, 69.21. Webb Simpson, fourth, 69.47. And then you get Patrick Reed at 69.5. He's finished first, second, sixth, and second here in six outings. Yeah. I, was, I just can't back Pat, Patrick Reed at 16 to 1. Just yeah, cannot do it. It's a, it's a difficult one. I'll, I'll talk about Reed now because I have backed him. He's the he's the one player towards the top that I've backed. Um, yeah. And the reason for that, I, I I agree on the price point because um, we tend to look at uh, Reed when he's a bit further out in the betting. You know, kind of forty fifty to one in the full field. This isn't a full field. It's a shorter field. Yeah. It's inevitably going to be a shorter price. Um, what got me is you mentioned um, in your preview, and we've talked about it quite a bit here, um, that putting and scrambling yeah. can r- tend to be the deciding factor here. And yeah. there are a few in the world who are scrambling better than P- Patrick Mead at the moment. I mean, if anyone watched those um, th- the performance you alluded to earlier at the Dubai um, DP World Tour Championship, then he was absolutely incredible mm. around the earth course. He was you know, getting up and down from absolutely everywhere. And to be fair, he's been putting and scrambling incredibly well for a few months now. And um, going back to the Tour Championship at East Lake, it was uh, first for scrambling there, first for putting at the US Open. Played well again um, around the greens at Wentworth. Um, tenth at the Masters overall, and he was second for putting there. So clearly, there's been a trend that his short game's been particularly strong. And then, of course, he went to the Earth Course, finished third there in December. So that kind of ticks the December box as well. Mm. Um, where his short game was outstanding. Um, record is fantastic. Um, yeah. You know, I, of the players that were just outside those top five, he was the one that caught my eye. And mm. as I say, sixteen to one is. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take that. It's an each way punt for me, um, and uh, see if he can get himself into those 
paying positions. Over 12 weeks, which are our form line, yeah, there's only Dustin Johnson with better form. Mm. And you've got DJ at sixes and then Reed at 16s. Next up is JT with seven to one, Ram at 15 to two. So, yes, in the top four for current form, and he's a 16 to one, the biggest price of those four. So it makes logical sense, doesn't it, with such a great course record? Yeah, 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 good enough for me. I just can't. I actually, I loved, I, I so loved Patrick Reed at the um, US Open. I just, and then he got right into the top of the leaderboard, and I just thought to myself, Patrick Reed just doesn't go away when he's in contention. And then that fuck, oh, I almost swore. <laughs> that Saturday came along, and I could not believe it. Yeah. It was back in the day where you could actually go to the pub. <laughs> and me and the missus and some of our two of our friends, we'd gone out for a, a meal. And we and got into my local. We got into my local village pub around the corner from where we live. Walked in there, and the guy's got Sky on, the landlord, and the golf was on. And I kind of didn't look because it was it was. And then I did look at the screen, and every time I looked at the screen, he was making a bogey. Mm. It was breaking my heart. As I was getting more and more alleviated, <laughs> just to soften the blow. I couldn't believe it, mate. I think when I walked in there, it was still like in second or third spot. By the time we got out of there at like I don't know twelve o'clock or quarter past twelve, he'd sunk into total and utter oblivion. I just could not believe it. But yeah, Reed's a good shout. He's obvious, but he's good. Yeah. Personally, at the price point, I would take Patrick Reed over Hideki Matsuama. Yeah, no. I th- at I least think... with Reed, you know that he can he can convert. He's a he's a no. Matsuama has at once in twenty seventeen, and we're yeah, getting him at eighteen to one. Been a while. Bermuda Green's not his strongest of suits either, is it? So, yeah, I'd be I'd be Reed over Matsuama. I'd rather be taking Matsuama at Phoenix at eighteen to one. Yeah. Something like this, personally. Um, if we're looking at this form angle as well, so 12 weeks going back, current form, this particular individual has got 24th, 11th, 4th, 2nd and 8th in his last five outings. Now, I was on board him, or on board with him, when he finished 2nd, and that was at the Masters. Yeah. And he then played the um, Shark Shootout, as I know it, the QBE Shootout. He played it with Mark Leishman in December. They finished eighth. That's Mm. immaterial. So he played some competitive golf on Bermuda Grass in December. Um, He's not a big winner, but then he's quite young. Um, Jumped back into the top 30 in the world last year with that fantastic finish. And when you look at this particular individual... He always tends to play his best golf from October onwards. And that kind of makes sense. He's an Australian, so Australians clearly, it would be their summer. But he just he, he seems to just play his, the best golf that of, his, of his career has always tended to be um, October through January. Now, he won the Hawaii, uh, the Sony Open in Hawaii last year to qualify for this. And I found him at 40 to 1, Cameron Smith. I, Cameron Smith was the first player I was going to tip in this. And that, I made that decision in the middle of December. Yeah. After the golf had all finished. What kind, what kind of price were you expecting? You, 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 I wasn't expecting 40 to 1. Yeah. yeah I can, and yeah. It, that was, that's a pleasant surprise. Mm. I thought I might get 28s or 33s, maybe. And I would have moaned that it was too short, but forty <laughs> to one. I thought forty to one was manna from heaven. Yeah, certainly backable at that price. Well, he's backable, and you just look at the guy the way the guy plays. He's pretty long off the tee. He's not overly straight, and you know the way that he played around Augusta. His driving was kind of okay. Um, some of his approach play from distance was fantastic, and then when he did get in trouble. His game from 100 yards and in, you know, with the hands, was absolutely sublime, wasn't it? The way he was getting out of trouble. And as we know with Cam Smith, an absolutely fantastic natural putter. 
he kind of follows the Patrick Reed line of inquiry in terms of the way that he plays his golf. Yeah. Now, I think he'll play well here. He's played here once, 17, so he's got course experience. That particular outing three years ago, you can't argue that Smith's not a better, more mature, far more comfortable on the PGA Tour kind of player this time around than he was three years ago. Uh, he shot, a, I think it was 68 on the Saturday, which was the tied third best score of the day. So he's starting to get his head around the golf, to- uh, the golf course at that point. I think Smith's got a lot going for him this week. I really do. Um, you look at his wins as well. Two on the European Tour, co-sanctioned Australian PGA. They, they played out at the Pines Valley. Is it Pines Course, I think? Yeah, yeah. Up at Surfers Paradise. Uh, and the two wins he's had in the States, one in Hawaii, and he, and he won the team event down in New Orleans, all on Bermuda grass greens. There's a pattern emerging. Well, there's a pattern. I'll tell you what else I noticed about Smith. If you look at Smith, um, and you look at, you know the tournament they play over in Korea? Yep. South Korea, the one CJ Cup, and they play at the top of the mountain. Quite a long golf course overlooking the sea over in um, Jeju Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look at JT's record there, it's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Gary Woodland has gone extremely cl- cl- close at that golf tournament as well to CJ Cup. Um, and you look at Cameron Smith, he's got a couple of top fives at that CJ Cup event, short field event as well. That's just another thing that kind of points me towards him this week. I think Cam Smith's got a big week in him. Mm. So 40 to 1, I've, I've, I've gobbled that up quickly. Further out, 66 is on um, Kevin Kisner appeals because we know how great he is on Bermuda grass. Is there anyone at a really big price that kind of you'd have a little play Yeah, I, I, I've backed one other. So as, as of now, I've only I've backed Patrick Reed, and I have backed Martin Laird at 250 to 1. Um, and that price, well, he's missed, missed his last two cuts. So you can look at his raw form line and think, well, you know, he's coming in the back of two missed cuts and he's playing against some extremely good players here this week. Yeah. Um, but prior to that, he won the Shriners. Um, he was 10th for putting that week. Um, that's not really his game. I mean, again, you know, you, you talked about players getting into the mix who are um, better from, better in terms of their ball striking um, than their short game. And um, to see a little bit of a spark with Laird's putter is interesting. Um, clearly, he did get the win on the back of that. But um, before that, he'd been pounding greens, um, hitting a lot of... Um, putting surfaces and not really converting. So to convert a few and get the job done was positive for him. Um, fourth year on Debbie back in 2010, second in 2012. He led the field for putting here that week. So he's clearly got on with the old surfaces here in the past, clearly changed a little bit since, but um, likes the track. Um, he talks yeah. about um, how he likes taking a driver. That's his default club. Um, mm-hmm. And this, this particular course, forces you to take a lot of drivers good in the yep. wind I mean it's not going to be particularly windy this this week but there are a couple of days where it's going to get up a bit and uh, that's um, clearly going to play to his strengths a little bit as well and um, I think he, he likes what he likes doesn't he he's, he you know, is led I was just, that's exactly what I was going to say he's a real horse for a course isn't he? I mean yeah. that shrine is victory yeah, a couple of wins there. He got um, and again, he, he was in that playoff that uh, Jonathan Bird won as well, wasn't he? So yeah. he's come very close a few times, or, or won a couple of times at the Shriners. Um, mm. Two top fours from three starts here. So um, for two hundred and fifty to one, um, with a win under his belt in his last three starts, I was quite happy to take on as a an each way long shot punt. He's another resort course specialist, isn't yeah. he? Where you know twenty three, twenty five under win. That's the kind of course Laird pops up on. Mm. When he gets a little bit of form and a little bit of a spark with that putter, then uh, starts making some birdies. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how he goes. But short field, um, you're getting six places. I've got six places each way, fifth of the odds. And um, for that 250 to one, and a field of just 42 players. So there's, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a fair proportion there, a fair, fair ratio that you're going to get a uh, mm. get, get an each way return out of it. So yeah, quite happy to take that. But yeah, they're, they're just the two that I've done. I think of the triple digits. I think there's a lot to be said for Martin Laird. It has to, yeah, I think that's a good angle. The other one I think has been showing a little bit of 
he's not he's not two hundred and fifty to one. The yeah. other one that seems to be showing signs of life recently is Kevin Nahm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One hundred and twenty five yeah. to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's playing better golf under the surface. Yeah, if this had bent grass, if this had bent grass greens, I'd be all over now like a rash because yeah. he never won on Bermuda. But he he can play Bermuda in terms of uh, fairways and rough and whatever. That's not a problem. Um, and we know with Nah, he he can he can he can top five in this, no problem at all. Mm. Yeah, and I've got to say his name did pop up on something again. If you're looking for. A comparable, you know, top. You, you look at someone like if 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 a Steve Stricker's won on a track, then mm. you're looking and thinking, well, can I pick out a player who, who can putt well? And uh, yeah, Nas a funny player, isn't he? You know, on any given week, any aspect of his game can be outstanding. But um, when he's oh, putting, he's got a hu- he's got a huge ceiling and a um, very low floor, isn't he? He's, yeah. he's one of those, and, and that's from a DraftKings perspective. It depends how you play your DraftKings. If you can look for value, value players sometimes. Mm. Like Kevin Nar will either kill you or. It will. It, it can lead to big, big returns on draft. Well, this is it, clearly yeah. the same with betting. Yeah. But there's something percolating there with Nar. Twelfth his last uh, one of the visits he's had here in 2012. The other really obvious pick that I had to go for towards the top end of the market was just Victor Hovland. Yeah. Until I really dug into the research on Hovland, um, I didn't realise just what kind of what he's been doing and the gravity of it. 23 years of age, two wins on his first full season on the PGA Tour. That's the f- that He became the fifth European player since 1945 to earn multiple victories sub-24 years of age. That list includes Rory McIlroy, Sergio Garcia, John Rahm and Seve Ballesteros. That is some company, isn't it? Yes, that's a decent uh, decent list of names to be alongside. He's now 14th in the world. And I just think this format is going to play so much to his strengths. Mm. Those two wins both came on golf courses that are on the coast. One, the Puerto Rico Open. Then one, of course, the Mayakoba Golf Classic in December. He won those, to- those tournaments both with 20 under totals. So it's not as if this guy can't pull a score together. Yeah. I know it's his course debut, and I know course debutants don't win this that much. Daniel Chopra did of all. Bizarrely, I mean, when you see Daniel Chopra winning the tournament of champions, that really is a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> but he won this in 2008 as a course debutant. But then you see elite names like Webb Simpson going very close when Steve Stricker won here. He finished second Simpson. Yeah. Jordan Spieth finished second here on course debut, and John Rahm finished second on course debut. You realise that someone with an, a, a real talent could turn up this week and play very, very well, and I think that's going to be Hovland, because clearly this guy is top-notch. T to green, he, his, that you know, driving the golf ball long and straight is a real speciality. He was seventh across the whole of last year for strokes gained on approach with his irons. It's clearly the chipping and the putting. My only thing with that will be is that I'd be amazed if Victor Hovland doesn't hit 80% of greens this week because they're huge. Yeah. And actually, his putting recently has been far better. And that's why I kicked myself that I never backed him the week he won at 22 to 1 because I'm not backing Victor Hovland at 22 to 1. There's no value in it. But we'd spotted and we mentioned on the podcast, and so did Barry, that his putter was warming. It was trending. And actually, you know, you just look at what he's been doing with the putter of late, Victor Hovland. This is a guy that could be one of the worst putters around professionally. But when he finds that when he finds it, it's clearly good. He was 12th for uh, putting average at the Mayakoba Golf Classic when he won. Uh, he was, t- I, I think, if you take people that made the cut, he was tenth for putts per GIR. And then um, last time out at the Earth Course, which was the week after Mayakoba, so he flew from Mexico to Dubai, all the trouble with the travel and whatever. Finished third, didn't he, at the DP World Tour yeah, Championship? And impressive. he was in the top top three for putting average. Yeah, no, it was impressive. Yeah, to, to come straight over and you know. 
with no preparation on the track whatsoever and to, to perform as he did was very, very noteworthy, as you say, and, and decent putting on those Bermuda greens out there. And I think that will have done him some good anyway because that's a big tournament. Mm. You know, he was clearly mixing it at the top end of the leaderboard across Saturday and Sunday. That would have been a, a kind of pressure that he's not been used to in the past, you know, in a, in a high-grade event like that. Yeah. And he came out and with, a, with a very strong third-place finish, what, two shots back from Westwood. So I don't think that's going to do it, it will have done anything but boost his confidence even more. Yeah. And I just think Hovland here at 22 to 1 is a decent pump. I yeah. can see him really, really. You can tell with Victor, it, I hope the only, the only thorn in Victor's side is he can start very sluggishly. Um, I'm, I'm just praying that he starts reasonably well on the Thursday. You know, getting that, get around the top 10, top 12 on day one. So he's in the tournament, uh, not too far back. And then he, he tends to improve with with time as the rounds go on and especially on the basis this is this is a new golf course to him but you know his record he, he, he his breakout event was that US Open at Pebble Beach wasn't it and he's always played well by the coast I think he's going to love this golf course I really do so I've gone JT, JT at the top win only I've gone Victor Hovland each way 22 to 1 and I have gone 40 to 1 with Cameron Smith. Those are my three for this week's Century Tournament of Champions. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, no, it's nice to get things back up and up and running. Um, another week of uh, Hawaii action next week for the Sony. And then, then we're over to the Middle East as well. So the European Tour picks up with um, Abu Dhabi as well. So uh, it's got a good few weeks of action to come in uh, January and uh, let's hope it all continues to plan over the next few weeks and months I don't think it's going to be much impact with um, professional sport is there at the highest level uh, it shouldn't be. they'll keep it trucking through fingers crossed fingers crossed because uh, can you imagine can you imagine being locked in your house with no sports watch oh, <laughs> oh, I, oh I do remember it, it was back in March and April wasn't it last yeah. year yeah <laughs> I do remember, yeah. Yeah, let's not go back. Then. When the highlight of your day was going out for a walk along the river or something like that. <laughs> or going to the supermarket. Yeah. I remember those days. Mm. Well, um, I hope um, Reed and Martin Laird go well for you. Are yeah, you going to have a sneaky, a sneaky fiver on JT, Winona? Yeah, I, I think, as I say, given, given your angle of attack with this in the past and success here... Uh, it all seems to point towards a Justin Thomas victory, so um, I think that would be the prudent thing to do. Hmm. Good on you. <laughs> well, uh, I wish you the best of luck. Yeah, and, best of luck. Uh, what, oh, do we quickly, quickly, because it'll only be the hardcore listen to this. Do you want to mention the um, majors competition? Yeah, so... That um, I completely forgot. No, no, so have I. So, um, as we've done for, I think this is the ninth consecutive year, um, mm. our friends at Bet365 have sponsored our majors competition once again, and you can enter via um, email, via the Facebook group, or via Twitter. And basically, we want you to give us the name of four major champions for this this year so we want you to pick a, a name for the masters a name for the pga championship a name for the us open a name for the open championship four separate names one and done effectively one and done yeah um, and you get scored based on their dollar earnings on the respective event that you pick them for so you, over the four events we'll accumulate a little leaderboard of how everyone um, scores and the winner will get £150, um, or currency equivalent, as a cash prize. Um, second place, £75. Third place, £25. Um, yeah, dead easy. So essentially, just give us four names. It's got to be four different names. Um, one for each of the four majors. And um, see how they fare once uh, all the action starts later in the year. Obviously, you need to get the you need to get your entries in before the first tea time at Augusta in the uh, start of April. Um, so there's plenty of time to enter. Um, we'll put further details on the um, uh, website. There are further details on the website. We'll put a link to that on the uh, on the podcast description here, so you can we will. find find your way over and um, get your entries in. 
I mean, we're golf nerds. We know where these things are, uh, are going to happen, although I'm trying to remember where the US Open. But the PGA Championship in May is going to be played at Kiowa Island, the Ocean Course, which is where Rory McIlroy won. Uh, he won the PGA Championship there the last time they played there. US Open is going to be played at Torrey Pines. Wow. A US Open at Torrey Pines. That is going to be wowzers. That's a long old golf course, isn't it? 7,600 yeah. yards with like five inch rough. What price Tiger, eh? <laughs> what, pl- what price Bryson DeChambeau? And then, of course, the Open Championship is going to be played, and we need to start to thinking about booking train tickets and the like. Royal St. George's Golf Club in Sandwich, Kent. Mm. Yeah, the one that was... Uh, Let's pray, us, yeah. Paul, that we can get out of the house in mid-July and go and watch some golf, even if we have to go in some kind of breathing apparatus. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. Let, let, uh, six months down the line, Steve, we've got to be able to go and watch a golf tournament like that. They've already cancelled it once, and I, I doubt if they got pandemic insurance this time around at the same the, pr- premium. Yeah, I think the premium may have been bumped up a little bit for this year. <laughs> I agree to meet Neil Fay, who's on our Facebook group. I agree. I know he listens to the pod on occasions. I've agreed that we're going to meet him at the bar behind. Is it the fifth green or the eighth green? I know that we spent far too long there last time we went. <laughs> we're going to have a few beers there, apparently. Yeah, why not? All I remember, Raw St George's. What a what an amazingly um, difficult links golf course that is. Mm. Yeah, it's a cracker, isn't it? Absolute cracker of a golf course. Yes, yeah, so they're the they're the courses. Kiowa Island, we've got Torrey Pines South Course for the US Open, and we've got Royal St George's for the Open. F- um, you know, throw that in with Augusta National. It's four fantastic golf courses yeah, for the majors this year. Yeah, lots to look forward to. Absolutely. So um, if you if you want to get your entries in, you'll find details in the dis- uh, podcast description. Uh, we'll put a link through to the uh, the page. So you know you can how you can enter by Twitter or a Facebook group or whatever. Well, Paul, thank you very much. Been uh, been a, been nice to have you back on the show. Yeah, yeah, best of luck. We'll speak next week. And thanks to listeners again. Um, Apple reviews. If you can give us a five star review, I and your name within that review, I will read it out at the start of the Sony Open podcast next week. Thanks for your time. I hope your bets go well, and we'll see you again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>